You ever had that moment where you just didn't know what was going to happen next? Where you said, what am I going to do now? Life didn't go the way you thought it was going to go. You had drawn it out, and you just knew exactly how things were going to go, and then you turned five, right? You know, as you get older, you start to realize life does not always go the way you want it to go. Things happen to us, things happen to our family, things happen to our friends, and we can feel very out of control sometimes and frustrated. And by the way, we love control, and that's sometimes why we get angry. We're, we're not angry because of anything that's around us. We're angry because we want to be in control of what's happening around us. In chapter 7 and 8 of the book of Daniel, God basically gives a vision to Daniel of the future. And it's really interesting because chapter 7, most of it and, and part of the book of Daniel is in Aramaic. And so that would be in order to let the people of Babylon know. By the way, Jesus spoke this language called Aramaic. I don't know if you knew that. But that would be in order to let the people know God knew this. And then as it gets into chapter 8, it changes over to Hebrew. Hebrew. So that the Israelites would know that God knew what was coming up. And when you look early on in the chapter, you have to ask, you know, these are fearful things. And so today we're going to cover that and talk about these things. And we're going to talk about truths about a fearful life. Now, when I was a kid, we had mason jars. I, I didn't have a mason jar at home, but since my wife's Italian, we almost always have a pasta sauce jar somewhere. Very easy to find. When I was a kid, we had mason jars. We were not fancy people. We were, well, hillbilly Americans. And uh, I get my mom upset sometimes because I said we lived in a nice neighborhood in a nice house, but we were hillbillies. We were the Miami hillbillies. And she says, no, we weren't. And I'm like, we were riding ATCs in our yard as kids. We had a zip line and a tree fort in the backyard. We lit fires. We burned things. We had piles of sand brought to us with dump trucks. We were the Miami hillbillies, okay? So instead of getting a fancy ant farm, how many of you ever had an ant farm when you were a kid? No? You poor deprived people. You're going to need to go and get yourself a mason jar today. So as kids, we'd get a mason jar and we'd go out in the yard and we would scoop up the ants. Now, I will say that we were not always the smartest children, so sometimes they were red ants. Oftentimes they were bull ants. Bull ants were cool because if we didn't feed them, they would hollow out. It was kind of fun to watch. And we would watch the ants through the jar and we'd see them dig the little tunnels. And of course, we were kids, so you know what we did once they got their tunnels all done, right? I wonder if they can do that again. Sure enough, they did it again. Now, here's what I realized. Even if ants were super smart and had great intelligence, they would only know what's inside of their jar. They, they probably wouldn't even know I was on the outside. They might see a blur once in a while go by, and they would definitely not know <laughs> what in the world that was about. All they would understand is what they see. See, we need to recognize that so often our perspective as Christians as followers of Christ, as people who want to do God's will and want to know God's will, our perspective is, is like the ants in the jar. Listen, have you ever seen the comparison of our planet just to the other planets? Do you realize that when I was in Miami, did you know we couldn't see the stars because of all the light? In the, when, I, when I first came to Titusville, when I first went to the mountains, I remember going, stars. And God positioned our planet in such a way in our universe that because of the way we're positioned, it's like we're looking over a shelf into our universe. God did that. Why? So we could see out of the jar. So we could know there's something bigger than us. Because the truth is, there's tons of places where if the earth was, we wouldn't be able to see anything outside of what we see. But because of where we're placed on this shelf of our universe, we're able to peer out and see distant galaxies and other planets and all kind of things that make us realize that we're so small. 
In chapter 7 and 8 of the book of Daniel, God gave Daniel these horrifying dreams. And you'll have to read them. And you'll read them like, yeah, 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 because you're safe as you read them. Daniel did not feel safe as he saw these visions of bears and these lions with wings and all these things he saw that were just crazy. But what was God doing? God was giving Daniel a glimpse of the future. And here's what's amazing about that. You know, in the New Testament, we have these wise men that show up at Jesus' birth, and they brought these, these gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which most theologians know came from the Babylon area. So it's almost like those wise men from Babylon knew something about a Savior to come, almost like some other wise man had tipped them off. It's, what a coincidence that must be. I want you to know today that you can trust your unknown future to a God who you can trust. In a fearful future, I want to encourage you today to do this. Listen, I want to encourage you to rest in His presence. Understand that just like the ants looking out, listen, by the way, you're much more important than an ant to God. God God knows your heart, your dreams, your worries, your fears. He cares about every one of those things. He he doesn't just take your life and do that, by the way. You know, some of you may feel that way some days. But you have a faithful father. Today we're going to talk about how faithful he is, that all is under Christ's control, and that he wants you to focus on your calling. So let's let's look at number one. We have a faithful father. So Daniel, in the beginning of chapter 7, if you get a chance, you can read all of that. Um, I can't go through all of it today, but basically God shows Daniel this amazing future. And when you look at it, it predicts uh, Babylon, and then it predicts the Medes and Persians, which we're going to look at a little bit later, and the Greeks, and this guy Alexander the Great that we've heard of. We've all heard of Alexander the Great who just swept across the world at that time. And so Daniel sees all these visions. He has no idea what any of it means. And in my vision at night, it says in verse 13, I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man. Now we know from the New Testament that that's Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And I love what Daniel does next. By the way, if, you, if you're reading people who are critical of Scripture, they will say, well, Daniel stole this story from someone else, which would be great, except that nowhere in recorded history do we have what happens next in any culture. Daniel says, I approach one of those standing there and ask the meaning of all this. Now, I don't know if he went up to Michael or who he went up to, but he basically said, what was that? So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. What was the angel saying to Daniel? Yes, these horrible things are going to happen, but God's got you. You can rest today no matter what your uncertainty, no matter what your fear, no matter what you don't know about the future, no matter who you're praying for right now, no matter who you're dealing with right now, whatever circumstance has been launched at you, you can rest in him. Why? Because we know in eternity who's got our back, who said, if you're a child of mine, I'm giving you everything. I love there's a verse that Jesus says, fear not, little flock, for the father has chosen gladly To give you his kingdom. I love that verse. Now you can imagine Daniel. Daniel grew up seeing this guy Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was walking around telling the truth. He would do all kind of stuff to to make people know the message. He one time brought in a a, uh, a ox, you know, the ox thing. And said, this is what God's doing to you because you've defied God. And the other prophets said, oh, he's lying. Don't listen to Jeremiah. He doesn't know what he's doing. They got so mad at Jeremiah because he was a truth teller. They threw him in a well. And so Daniel realized early on, hey, I'm going to tell the truth. So you remember early in the chapters when Daniel interpreted dreams, most of those dreams were not good for the king. Do you realize that? 
It would be like, so one of the dreams, you remember the writing on the wall? The writing on the wall is one of my favorites because Daniel basically goes to the king and says, here's the meaning of your dream, you're going to die, and somebody else is taking over. And that king so believed Daniel that he gave Daniel a position of authority and a Mr. T starter kit. He gave him gold chains to hang around his neck. He, he gave him a position of authority. But I got to thinking about it. It would be like being on the Titanic. And as you hit, you're about to hit the iceberg, the captain goes, oh, by the way, you're now co-captain. Thanks. But Daniel told the truth anyway. He knew the truth mattered, and so he told it. And in Luke chapter 1, the angel comes to Mary to tell her what's going on. And he refers back to Daniel chapter 7. And he says this, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. And his kingdom will never end. There'll be a day when no longer will you be confined in what you know and what you feel and what you think. A lot of, listen, a lot of us have baggage. We think about the world certain ways because of the way we grew up. We think certain ways because we're Americans. We think certain ways because we maybe had Italian heritage or in my case, Irish heritage. I have generations of passive aggressive behavior. I mean, I mean, you, this skill is long earned. We know how to, how to do it. Italians don't know how to do that. If you're Italian, you just have aggressive aggressive. Right? And you are who you are because of how you grew up and everything. But one day, the lid will be off. And you'll see everything that God has done for you. And the way that he, he trained the course of your life. And the awesomeness of what he's done around you. When you wake up at night, you can rest in his presence knowing God will take care of me. You ever say that out loud? God will take care of me. There's times that you probably just need to say when you start fretting and fearing and freaking out. That's three F's. That was really good. God will take care of me. Number two, we need to recognize that all is under Christ's command. Now, my mom for years had a timeshare down in Hutchinson Island. We actually used to go there to a place called Holiday Out when we were kids. One of the biggest waves, rogue waves that I was ever hit by happened there. I still remember my older brother who was gigantic standing here and my brother and I looking at him. And suddenly there was a wave that was above his head that came out of nowhere. I still remember just getting washed up on the beach. And back then it was funny. If that happened today, you would visit me in the hospital. I used to be flexible. So she got this timeshare on Hutchinson Island right when it first opened. And I can remember year after year, we went there for 20-something years together as a family. And year after year, I remember sitting on that back porch as at nighttime, the clouds would move away over the ocean. And you could look out and see the lightning going from cloud to cloud, from cloud to the to the ocean, sometimes just flashing. You didn't know where it was coming from. Sometimes the whole sky would light up. Strings of lightning would come across. And I remember looking out there and thinking, wow, that is so awesome. When you get afraid sometimes and you get fearful sometimes, you and I need to recognize and look around us at the amazing things that God has created and recognize that that same God who controls the universe loves you. And so the good news is it's all under Christ's command. So, verse, so chapter 7 continues, it's talking about the angel. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It'll be different from all the other kingdoms. It'll devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. Let me just give you a little thing. Talking about Alexander the Great there. And then the ten horns could mean the people who followed Alexander the Great. And could be talking about something that's going to happen even in our future. We don't know. But the good news is we know who knows. And so it continues. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He'll subdue the three kings. He'll speak against the Most High, oppress his holy people, and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, 
half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. By the way, when the Jews uh, celebrate Hanukkah, they celebrate the Maccabees and this very thing that happened right here in this passage. I wish I had more time for that today. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. No matter who you think is important as a leader, no matter who you think is in charge, guess what? They're not in charge. Do you know why Daniel knew this? Because he was in Jerusalem and pulled away from Jerusalem. And then he was under one king, and guess what? That king lost two, and then another king lost, and then another. And guess what? Daniel kept going through. He didn't just go through the fire. He went through trials, and he had to stand up, and he had to go through wars and battles, and he saw people persecuted. He was in Jerusalem, as Jeremiah is saying, it's about to fall, and they sieged Jerusalem and ran out of everything. You think it was bad to run out of toilet paper. They ran out of everything. Daniel knew who was in control, even when it looked like other powers and other people controlled their life. You ever feel like I can't get a break? You ever feel like I, I thought I was through that fire? I can imagine Daniel felt that way. Daniel had to go king after king like, oh, really? Another one? I mean, even as he's doing the writing on the wall thing, Daniel had to read it and be like, oh, no. All right, you're going to die tonight. <clears throat> okay, here's a chain. Great, thanks. Next, and start all over again. Get to the top, start all over again. You ever feel that way? Daniel knew how you felt, but you know what? God also knows your suffering. He knows what you're going through. And the good news is, one day, the Bible says, the kingdom will be given to you. As a believer, he gives us the keys to his kingdom. It's awesome. How do I know that? Because Revelation 17, 14 says this, They'll wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. When everything was going wrong, Daniel could rest in his presence knowing that God was in control. When Daniel didn't know what was going to happen next, he just would say, God is in control. Has there been a time that you just needed when you felt out of control that you needed to say, God is in control? You're frustrated and aggravated. You can't believe what's happening in Afghanistan. You don't like what's happening here or there. You're praying for friends. You're praying for neighbors. You don't know, you know, you're trying to get good information about the virus and you refuse to call my sweet wife and you think you're going to talk to all kinds of people on the internet and they're going to help you. And you're frustrated and aggravated. Hey, hey, God is in control. When's the last time you said God's in control? God, would you guide me? I know you're in control. Daniel could rest in the middle of all this upset. Why? Because God was in control. Even though the visions that he saw freaked him out. How do I know that? Because of what's next. Number three, carry out your calling today. Now, this next section is kind of a, a focus on one section of the vision he had. And it is about the Medes and the Persians against the Greeks. Now, Ernie and I talked about this after church last night. We both said, we can't watch super violent movies. We, we have a hard time with Saving Private Ryan. It's, it's hard. I can't watch the whole thing. And there's a movie called 300 that I definitely can't watch. But I've seen little pieces of it. And even the little pieces that I've seen are like, oh, I can't even imagine living then. That story of the 300 is what is happening in chapter 8. That's the violence that is going on. That is the, the attacks that are going on. It is this unbelievable war that was happening. And we're able to distance ourselves because we don't live there now. But guess what? Daniel did. And Daniel was warning the Jewish people, hey, here's what's coming. Heads up. But God hasn't forgotten you. So here's what happens next. And it says, he'll cause deceit to prosper. He'll consider himself superior. Now, in this we talk about the Antichrist. But we also talk about these Greek and Persian rulers that were doing this. When they feel secure, he'll destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. 
The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true. And then listen to what he says to Daniel. But seal it up, for it concerns the distant future. It would be like God saying to us, don't worry about this yet. Jesus said something like that, like, don't worry about, oh yeah, tomorrow. And I love what Jesus says next. He says, because today's got enough worries of its own. What? What? Don't worry about tomorrow. You got enough trouble today. That's what Jesus said. Deal with what you have today. So that's what Daniel does. Listen to what he says next. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Time out. When we worry, when we fret, when we're overwhelmed, guess what? It doesn't just exhaust us mentally. It exhausts us physically. And some of you are tired not because you've been working hard, but because you've been thinking hard. The movie that you play in your mind is not a movie that anybody wants to watch, and it's most likely things that either aren't true or may not come true, but you can't do anything about them anyway. So quit focusing on what you can't control. So Daniel rested. And then what did he do? Then I got up and I went about the king's business. Why? What was Daniel's job? The king's business. Guess what your job is? The king's business. You may think you work for your boss, but you work for the king of kings. You have a job, but you also have a ministry. Did you know everyone is called to ministry? Everyone. Some people are called to be pastors, but everyone is called to ministry. You are called to minister where you are. Daniel was called to minister where he's at. What a witness he was everywhere he was. You can be a witness if you're at the Space Center, if you're at Burger King, even if you work at Walmart. I know people who work at Walmart, they're like, no, no, I can't be a witness there. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I was appalled by the vision, and I love this, it was beyond understanding. Daniel says, I have no idea what I just saw, but I'm going to focus on what I can do something about. There are things going on in this world right now that you can do nothing about, and you'll just get yourself overwhelmed. So what does God call you to do? Seal it up. Do what he's called you to do today. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the end times and he says this, Who then is faithful and a wise servant when the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? He's talking about us. You're responsible for taking care of other people. You're responsible for ministering to the people God's put in your path. And then he says this, It'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Over and over, Jesus was asked, Hey, when are you coming back? When are you going to set up the kingdom? When are you going to do this? And Jesus over and over would say, just do what I've called you to do. Very loose translation, but that's what he said. Over and over he'd point them, hey, feed my sheep. Do what I've called you to do. What has God called you to do? I know you're worried about everything around, and you can be. Or you can rest in his promises. When it seems like evil people are winning, just do what God's called you to do. There are things that you can't do a thing about. There are a lot of things that you can't do anything about. You can't even control your own children when they're teenagers. So who do you think you are, right? You have this wonderful child, and then they turn 11, and you're like, what in the world just showed up in my house? Then they turn 13, and you think, Satan. Satan showed up in my house, right? You can't control them. Why do you think you're going to control something that's happening around the world? God, I'm going to trust you. God, I'm going to rest in you. Knowing that you are powerful and you are mighty. And sometimes all I can see is what's in my little anthill. But God, you see all. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to rest in you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. That's the first way to get out of your little ant jar. It's to look into eternity and say, God, I'm going to trust you with my eternity. One of the great things about Dale Back's funeral tomorrow is I don't have to lie because I know he knew Jesus. And with Jesus, there's no more suffering and sorrow and pain and hurt. The best day you've ever had on earth is just a taste of what heaven is like. And one day, we're all going to be released from this earth. So if you're here today and you've never given your life to him, you can do that now. Also, if you're a Christian and you've been fretting, I want to encourage you to rest in him this week. Remind yourself that you're not in control. Remind yourself that you're not God. 
and let him take care of you because he loves you. He controls all things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we thank you for these moments. We thank you for your word. We thank you that even Daniel, when he looked into the future, as wise as he was, as many languages as he spoke and wrote and all kind of, he totally didn't understand. And Father, we don't understand sometimes. But Father, we choose to trust you. And we know that one day you will give us the keys to the kingdom when we trust you. Even when we don't get it all right, when we trust and put our faith in Jesus, you said that you forgive all of our sins and you'll take us home to be with you. We thank you for that today. Lord, I pray for anyone here who doesn't know you or someone watching online that today would be the day they surrender to you knowing you died for their sins and rose again so that they could be with you forever. Father, I pray also for that Christian who's worried, who's struggling, who's frustrated, who's irritated because they can't control what's happening, that today we would surrender all of those things to you, knowing that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen.